Hello, this is a read aloud of the Unit 3 test. I'm going to application share the test and read through the passages, the questions, and the options. If at any time you need to pause the recording, please do so as you work on your test. You can also open your test and just listen along while I read it. But again, you may need to pause the recording so that you can complete your questions and answers. Okay, this is the first passage of the Unit 3 test. The Open Window by H. H. Monroe. My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttall said a very self-possessed young lady of 15. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. Frampton Nuttall endeavored to say the correct something, which should duly flatter the niece of the moment without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Privately, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much towards helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be un undergoing. I know how it will be, his sister had said when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul, and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. I shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there. Some of them, as far as I can remember, were quite nice. Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Stapleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction, came into the nice division. Do you know how many of the do you know many of the people around here? asked the niece when she judged that they had sufficient silent communion. Hardly a soul, said Frampton. My sister was staying here at the rectory, you know, some four years ago, and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here. He made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret. Then you practically then you know practically nothing about my aunt, pursued the self possessed young lady. Only her name and address, admitted the caller. He was wondering whether Mrs. Stapleton was the married or widowed state. An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. Her great tra tragedy happened just three years ago, said the child. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy, asked Frampton. Somehow, in this restful country spot, tragedy seemed out of place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an October afternoon, said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened onto the lawn. It is quite warm for the time of year, said Frampton, but has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? Out through that window, three years ago to a day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day's shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favorite snipe shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog. It had been a dreadful wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back someday, they and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them, and walk in at that window just as they used to do. That is why the window is kept open every evening till it is quite dusk. Poor dear aunt. She has often told me how they went out, her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm, and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Bertie, why do you bound? as he always did to tease her, because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes on still, quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk through that window. She broke off with a little shudder. It was a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late and making her appearance. I hope Vera has been amusing you, she said. She has been very interesting, said Frampton. I hope you don't mind the window open, said Mrs. Stapleton briskly. My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting, and they always come in this way. 
They've been out for a snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make me a fine mess over my poor carpets. So you like men fo so like you menfolk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds and the prospects for duck in the winter. To Frampton, it was all purely horrible. He made a desperate but only partial successful effort to turn the talk on the less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention, and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. The doctors agree in ordering me to complete rest, an absence of mental excitement and avoidance of anything in the, nat in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton, who labored under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities, their causes and cure. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. No? said Mrs. Stapleton in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention, but not to what Frampton was saying. Here they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea. Don't they look as if they were muddy up to the eyes? Frampton shivered slightly and turned towards the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with a dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn towards the window. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly, they neared the house, and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the dusk. I said, Bertie, why do you bound? Frampton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid imminent collision. Here we are, my dear, said the bearer of the white Macintosh coming in through the window. Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as he came up? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttle, said Mrs. Stapleton could only talk about his illness and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was a spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of pariah dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creature snarling and grinning and foaming just above him enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Romance at short notice was her specialty. Now moving on to the questions. Question one, how does the conversation between Frampton and Mrs. Stapleton affect the plot? A, Frampton learns during their conversation that Mrs. Stapleton is insane, resolving the conflict of the story. B, Frampton believes that Mrs. Stapleton's husband and family are dead, while Mrs. Stapleton speaks as though they are alive. This builds tension. C, Frampton, after waiting all day to speak with Mrs. Stapleton, is unable to speak to her. This marks the climax of the story. Question two, how does Frampton advance the plot of the story, The Open Window? A. He believes the young lady's story about her aunt's tragedy. B. He thinks the weather is warm for October. Or C. He doesn't know if Mrs. Stapleton is married or widowed. Question 3. Which line from the story foreshadows the trick the niece will play? A, her great tragedy happened just three years ago, said the child. That would be since your sister's time. B, my aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttle, said a very self-possessed young lady of 15. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. C, then you know practically nothing about my aunt, pursued the self-possessed young lady. Question 4. 
Question four. Read these sentences from the open window. The child was staring out through the open window with a dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of, fe of nameless fear, Frampton swung around in his seat and looked in the same direction. Which phrase from these sentences contributes most to the sense of surprise? A, dazed horror in her eyes. B, staring out through the open window. Or C, looked in the same direction. Moving on to this second excerpt from The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe is well known for writing short stories with, with a macabre or ghastly theme. In this story, the narrator, Montressor, believes Fortunato has spoken ill of him. Montressor has plotted revenge and lured Fortunato into his cellar with the promise of a taste of a very special type of wine called Amontillado. Fortunato is having a coughing fit at the beginning of this excerpt. Montressor pretends to be worried about him, but he really wants revenge. <coughs> My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It's nothing, he said at last. Come. I said with decision, we will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it's no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchesi. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true. I replied, and indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. A draught, a draught of this medic will defend us from the damps. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. He again took my arm, and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive, but let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again arrived at a deep crypt, in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt there appeared another less spacious, its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth side, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the walls thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet wide, four feet in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely the interval between, the two of, between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. Proceed, I said. Herein is the amontillado. As for Lucrezzi, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward while I followed immediately as at his heels. A moment more and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other, about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. The Amontillado, ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied, the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. 
I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier and the third and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which that I might hearken to it with the mere with the more satisfaction. I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon level with my breast. I again paused and holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. It was now midnight and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth the ninth and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> a very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We shall have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo. <laughs> the Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado, but is it not getting late? Will not they be awaiting us at the palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and the rest, let us be gone. Yes. He said, let us be gone. For the love of God, Montressor. Yes, I said, for the love of God. But to these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud. Fortunato. No answer. I called again. Fortunato. No answer still. I thrust the torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth a in reply, only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position and plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In peace, Reykjavik. Moving on to question five. How does Fortunato advance the plot of the cask of Amontillado? A, he eagerly follows Montressor into the crypt. B, he leans on Montressor's arm as they walk. Or C, he plasters a wall between himself and the outside world. Question six. Which line from the story reveals Montressor's true intentions in his dealings with Fortunato? A. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. B. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. C. But to these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud. Question seven, how does the author create a sense of tension? A, the author uses dialogue to slow the pace. B, the author uses flashback to reveal secrets about the main characters. C, the author intentionally withholds information from readers, leaving them in the dark about the characters' motivations. Question eight, part A, read these sentences from the cask of Amontillado. Enough, he said, the cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, I replied. 
Which literary technique is employed in these sentences? A, pacing. B, withholding information. C, foreshadowing. Question nine, part B, why does the author use the technique from the previous question? A, to create a humorous tone, B, to show realism, or C, to build suspense? Question 10. Read these sentences from the cask of Amontillado. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. How does the author create surprise in these sentences? A, by foreshadowing. B, by revealing shocking information. C, by withholding information. The third excerpt is from the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. The autobiography of Benjamin Franklin is divided into four parts and documents Franklin's life from 1771 to 1790. My elder brothers were all put apprentices to different trades. I was put to the grammar school at eight years of age, my father intending to devote me as the tithe of his sons to the service of the church. My early readiness in learning to read, which must have been very early, as I do not remember when I could not read, and the opinion of all of his friends that I should certainly make a good scholar, encouraged him in this purpose of his. My Uncle Benjamin, too, approved of it and proposed to give me all his shorthand volumes of sermons, I suppose as a stock to set up with if I would learn his character. I continued, however, at the grammar school not quite one year, though in that time I had risen gradually from the middle of the class of that year to be the head of it, and farther was removed into the next class above it in order to go with that into the third at the end of the year. Question 11, part A, what effect does the phrase, my father intending to devote me as the tithe of his sons to the service of the church have on the meaning of this passage? A, it implies he has no choice in the career he will have. B, it demonstrates the importance of the church. C, it proves that he is smarter than his brothers. Question 12, part B, how does the phrase, my father intending to devote me as the tithe of his sons to the service of the church, contribute to this passage's tone? A, it adds a touch of humor, B, it creates a sense of hopefulness, or C, it offers a sense of obligation. Question 13. Read this excerpt from the autobiography of Ben Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. The autobiography of Benjamin Franklin is divided into four parts and documents Franklin's life from 1771 to 1790. Select the sentence in the paragraph that demonstrates a tone of superiority. About the end of April 1724, a little vessel offered for Boston. I took leave of Keimer as going to see my friends. The governor gave me an ample letter saying many flattering things of me to my father and strongly recommending the project of my setting up at, a, at Philadelphia as a thing that must make my fortune. We struck on a shoal and going down the bay and sprung a leak. We had a blustering time at sea and were obliged to pump almost continually, at which I took my turn. We arrived safe, however, at Boston in about a fortnight. I had been absent several months, and my friends had heard nothing of me, for my brother Holmes was not yet returned and had not written about me. My unexpected appearance surprised the family. 
All were, however, very glad to see me and made me welcome, except my brother. I went to see him at his printing house. I was better dressed than ever, while in his service, having a genteel new suit from head to foot, a watch, and my pockets lined with a near five pounds sterling in silver. He received me not very frankly, looked me all over, and turned to his work again. So again, question 13 says, select the sentence in the paragraph that demonstrates a tone of superiority. A, about the end of April 1724, a little vessel offered for Boston. I took leave of Keimer as going to see my friends. B, my unexpected appearance surprised the family. All were, however, very glad to see me and made me welcome, except my brother. Or C, I was better dressed than ever while in his service, having a genteel new suit from head to foot, a watch, and my pockets lined with near five pounds sterling in silver. Next, excerpt from the Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin is divided into four parts and documents Franklin's life from 1771 to 1790. My brother had, in 1720 or 1721, begun to print a newspaper. It was the second that appeared in America and was called the New England Current. The only one before it was the Boston Newsletter. I remember his being dissuaded by some of his friends from the undertaking as not likely to succeed, one newspaper being, in their judgment, enough for America. At this time, there are not less than five and twenty. He went on, however, with the undertaking, and after having worked in composing the types and printing off the sheets, I was employed to carry the papers through the streets to the customers. He had some ingenious men among his friends who amused themselves by writing little pieces for this paper, which gained in credit and made it more in demand, and these gentlemen often visited us. Hearing their conversations and their accounts of the approbation their papers were received with, I was excited to try my hand among them. But being still a boy and suspecting that my brother would object to printing anything of mine in his paper if he knew it to be mine, I contrived to disguise my hand. And writing an anonymous paper, I put it in at night under the door of the printing house. It was found in the morning and communicated to his writing friends when they called it as usual. They read it commented on it in my hearing, and I had the exquisite pleasure of finding it met with their approbation, and that in their different guesses at the author, none were named but men of some character among us for learning and ingenuity. I suppose now that I was rather lucky in my judges, and that perhaps they were not really so very good ones as I then esteemed them. Encouraged, however, by this, I wrote and conveyed in the same way to the press several more papers, which were equally approved, and I kept my secret till my small fund of sense for such performance was pretty well exhausted, and then I discovered it. When I began to consider a little more by my brother's acquaintance, and in the matter that did not quite please him, as he, had, as he thought, probably with reason, that it tended to make me to vain. And perhaps this might be one occasion of the differences that we began to have about this time. Though a brother, he considered himself as my master and me as his apprentice, and accordingly expected the same services from me as he would from another, while I thought he demeaned me too much in some required in some he required of me, who from a brother expected more indulgence. Our disputes were often brought before a father, and I fancy I was either generally in the right or else a better pleader because the judgment was generally in my favor. But my brother was passionate and had often beaten me, which I took extremely amiss, and thinking my apprenticeship very tedious, I was continually wishing for some opportunity of shortening it, which at length offered in a manner unexpected. Question 14.
according to me. Read this sentence from paragraph three. But my brother was passionate, and he had often beaten me, which I took extremely amiss. And thinking my apprenticeship very tedious, I was continually wishing for some opportunity of shortening it, which at length offered in a manner unexpected. How does the word extremely contribute to this passage? A, it makes the tone of the passage more casual. B, it emphasizes how the narrator felt about his brother. Or C, it demonstrates the violent relationship between the two brothers. And moving on to the final passage. This is an excerpt from The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell. This is one we read in class. But the animal, General Zaroff. Oh, said the general. It supplies me with the most exciting hunting in the world. No other hunting compares with it for an instant. Every day I hunt and never grow bored now. For I have a quarry with which I can match my wits. Rainsford's bewilderment showed in his face. I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, explained the general. So I said, what are the attributes of an ideal quarry? And the answer was, of course, it must have courage, cunning, and above all, it must be able to reason. But no animal can reason, objected Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, there is one that can. But you can't mean, gasped Rainsford. And why not? I can't believe you are serious, General Zaroff. This is a grisly joke. Why should I not be serious? I am speaking of hunting. Hunting? Good God, General Zaroff. What you speak of is murder. The general laughed with entire good nature. He regarded Rainsford quizzically. I refuse to believe that so modern and civilized a young man as you harbors romantic ideas about the value of human life. Surely your experience in the war did not make me condone cold-blooded murder, finished, finished Rainsford stiffly. Laughter shook the general. How extraordinarily droll you are he said. One does not expect nowadays to find a young man of the educated class, even in America, with such a naive and, if I may say so, mid-Victorian point of view. It's like finding a snuff box in a limousine. Uh, well, doubtless you had your Puritan ancestors. So many Americans appear to have had. I'll wager you'll forget your notions when you go hunting with me. You have a genuine new thrill in store for you, Mr. Rainsford. Thank you. I am a hunter, not a murderer. Dear me, said the general, quite unruffled. Again, that unpleasant word. But I think I can show you your scruples are quite unfounded. Yes? Life is for the strong to be lived by the strong and, if needs be, taken by the strong. The weak of the world were put here to give the strong pleasure. I am strong. Why should I not use my gift? If I wish to hunt, why should I not? I hunt the scum of the earth. Sailors from tramp ships, Laskers, blacks, Chinese, whites, mongrels. A thoroughbred horse or hound is worth more than a score of them. But they are men, said Rainsford hotly. Precisely, said the general. That's why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They can reason after a fashion, so they are dangerous. But where do you get them? The general's left eye fluttered down in the wink. This island is called Ship Trap, he answered. Sometimes an angry god of the high seas sends them to me. Sometimes, when Providence is not so kind, I help Providence a bit. Question 15, Part A. What does the interaction between the hunters reveal about Zaroff's attitude towards Rainsford? A, he thinks of Rainsford as a worthy opponent. B, he believes Rainsford's view of life and death are, insin are, sorry, are insincere. C, he views Rainsford's moral stance as misguided and uninformed.
Question 16, Part B, how does Zorowski's attitude advance the plot of this passage? A, since Zorowski's range toward as sentimental, he misjudges him as an opponent. B, because Zoroff is intelligent, he tries to be a master of men. C, since Zoroff enjoys conversation with Rainsford, he uses it to analyze his enemy. And question 17, which, what does the interaction between Rainsford and General Zoroff reveal about Rainsford's attitude towards Zoroff? A, he is afraid of Zaroff's lack of self-control. B, he questions Zaroff's sanity. C, he believes Zaroff's behavior is inhumane. And question 18 is for completion points. I took my time and completed this test to the best of my ability. A, yes, B, no. And this concludes the read aloud of your unit three test.